So just continuing on the topic, so remember two weeks ago before Kevin preached, I preached about musical instruments and why we prefer to sing without musical instruments. So I think it's the intention of the New Testament um, church that God has ordained and um, that musical instruments were just part of the Old Testament temple worship and that's where we see them used in the Bible and that has been done away with the Levitical priesthood and things to do with the um, order of service of the house of the Lord in the Old Testament. But just continuing on the topic of music in general, a um, couple of thoughts I want to give you this morning. Uh, hopefully it will be helpful for you. But first uh, point I want to address is, you know, what makes music bad? You know, there's a lot of debate over music, what sort of, what sort of genre of music should be used in church, what shouldn't be used. Um, I believe that there are, a lot of, there are a lot of rules out there and standards that are just man-made. And often a lot of these standards and rules are not actually uh, consistently followed. But it is a huge topic because it, I mean, music is a, is a large part of um, the Christian church gathering, isn't it? And because it's something external, kind of like clothing and appearance, it becomes a, a big thing. And generally people dispute and argue about it because there isn't really like clear guidelines given in the Bible. It requires a bit of conscience, a bit of judgment, human judgment, a, a bit of our own preference and I think when we're debating over different preferences there really is sometimes no right and wrong answer and that's why people you know debate about it so much but then come to no conclusions and just have to agree to disagree and in fact I think there is something going on in the independent Baptist circle right now I think Robert Bax wrote some book about worship wars and people are now you know ex exposing that and disputing it I haven't read all the arguments so I don't really have a position on it but just just bringing it up to you but it is a, a big issue that people fight over. Uh, I don't think it really needs to be. Um, but, you know, it's interesting to talk about it nonetheless. I, I don't think just because something is a lesser important thing doesn't mean it, it's not worthy of our discussion and our study. Um, we just don't need to uh, create enemies over it, in, in my opinion. But, um, you know, what makes music bad? What are, some, what are some common reasons or standards that people use but I don't believe are always applied consistently? Well, one is... Uh, the age of the song, right? You know, some of the people, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, this new fandangled hokey pokey that these new contemporary liberal churches are using. But just because a song is new doesn't necessarily make it wrong, right? Because, you know, newsflash, even the old songs at one point were new, right? I mean, the, the songs that we sing, they're like, yeah, you got to go back to the old path, the old traditional songs of the faith. And they're talking about songs that were written four or five hundred years ago. You know, well, you know, if you lived in the, in the 1400s or whatever, this is a new song. And in fact, you know, I, I've read things on the internet where you see quotes from, you know, old church fathers and, and, you, and you know, maybe Fanny Crosby at one time was being criticised for writing new hymns, that they were too upbeat, you know, because the church was used to this solemn, slow type of music. And then when these more upbeat songs came along and then when musical instruments came along, they were like... So at, at every point in time, you know, my point is, every old song was new at one point in time, right? So you can't, you, you can't just dis, uh, say a song is wrong purely on the basis of its age. Um, so that's, that's one that is not normally applied consistently. Um, what about the type of instruments that are used? Because right now, we're not just talking about you know, music in church, because I addressed that two weeks ago. I'm talking about just music in general, you know, because uh, listening to music is not a sin. <coughs> Um, so one, one thing people will say is, well, what about the instruments that are used? And this is why I'm in Psalms 150, because oftentimes you'll hear people say, oh, you know, don't copy the world's music and have, you know, electrical guitars and percussion instruments and things like that. But when we read in Psalm 150, you know, we do read about the harp in verse 3, praising with the sound of the trumpet, praising with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and organs. I mean, I don't know whether that automatically rules out electrical versions of those, you know, because if you have a stringed instrument and you have an organ and then you plug that into an amp and then maybe manipulate the instrument or the sound so it sounds a little different, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether you can rule those out and just say, oh, it's only, you know, non-electronical, ele electrical musical instruments. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's that. And then it says, Praise him a lot upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. So even percussion instruments are used. So I don't know if necessarily a drum kit is, is, um, 
is sinful or not. Well, you know, people dispute about these things. I mean, my position is, I mean, it's a non-issue for us because we don't even, I prefer not to have musical instruments at all. So I don't have to engage in, you know, what type of musical instruments are right or wrong. I think just rather just don't have musical instruments. I, I think voices, um, in my opinion, are a lot better and I think um, what God intended. So I don't think you can, you can really uh, you know, say music is wrong on the basis of what musical instruments are used. I mean, there are maybe musical instruments that aren't even mentioned that David may have invented and used to praise the Lord that God was happy with. Um, yeah, I mean, I've heard people say, you know, the type of music, you know, because one time I asked uh, at one of the first churches I went to was, you know, why do we only sing songs with a piano? You know, like, well, how do you justify not using a drum kit and things like that? And then I remember the answer was, well, we can see the sort of musical instruments that God, God is praised with in heaven, you know, the harps and things like that. So then that's where they get that sort of you know, classical and gentle feel. But then, you know, I mean, God was happy with them praising him with cymbals, high sounding cymbals, make a, a joyful noise unto the Lord. So I don't know whether we can really... Um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, say, say like a certain type of music is wrong based on the instruments that are used. Um, so just because a church uses different types of instruments, that doesn't necessarily make them worldly. Um, so, so I don't think any, any instrument in and of itself is inherently sinful. Um, I just think it's, it's not the intention of the New Testament church. But mu music in general, I mean music that uses musical instruments, um, is not necessarily wrong. Um, what's another one? So we've got uh, age of the song, what are the in types of instruments used? Uh, another one people will say is uh, the emotion that that song gives. And they'll say like, you know, and I, I, I do agree with this to a certain extent. You know, songs should be about the doctrine that it teaches, not necessarily the emotion that it gives you. But the thing is, all music creates an emotion, doesn't it? Even when you were listening, you know, watching those cartoons, I mean, the type of music that is used changes uh, how that cartoon is actually viewed. And I, might, I, might, I wasn't planning on showing you this. I was, I was thinking about it, but I'll just show you. I, I just want to show you the original video to The Unjust Servant. Because if you remember when you watched The Unforgiving Servant, um, video, the, the feeling that it gave you, right, with the type of music that it used. Let me show you just the original. Uh, yeah. This is the original, okay? This story will show you what the kingdom of heaven is like. One day, a king decided to call in his officials and ask them to give an account of what they owed him. As he was doing this, one official was brought in who owed him 50 million silver coins. But he didn't have any money to pay what he owed. The king ordered him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all he owned, in order to pay the debt. The official got down on his knees and began begging, Have pity on me, and I will pay you every cent I owe. <laughs> no, I'll just stop it there. So you get the point. Um... So, so music, all music creates an emotion, right? So, so you can see the music that's used in that clip, it gives it a more childish sort of feel. Um, and there's a reason why I didn't use that music, because they didn't supply that soundtrack, so I had to choose a different soundtrack to go with the music. So I decided to use the music that's actually from um, the Elijah and the Prophets of Baal music, um, and it gave it a much darker and much more serious feel to it, didn't it? So my point there is, you know, all music creates an emotion, um, and it's... And it's not necessarily wrong to cre to, for music to create an emotion because sometimes you want to use music for that purpose, right? And that's why, you know, different movies and different shows and things like that or different advertisements use different music because they do want to invoke an emotion. But just because a song, uh, song's goal is to, it, or the music of a song is to invoke a certain emotion doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong because there are hymns that evoke emotion. I mean, there are some hymns that are quite emotional to me that, you know, even the tune is, is quite emotional. Um, that doesn't necessarily make it wrong. So you can't say a song is wrong purely based on the emotion that it gives you. Um, but, you know, I, I will say this. So let's go to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. 
that there that that if a song creates a positive or a negative emotion, I think if somebody, if all they listened to was songs that created negative emotions, that's not good. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong inherently with a song that creates a negative emotion. But if that's all you're listening to, I think that is a sin. Why? Because in Philippians 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So whilst... Things that are negative and you know, not necessarily positive are not sinful in and of themselves. I think God does exhort us to be positive. You know, if there's a choice between being a pessimist and an optimist, we ought to be an optimist, right? We ought to see the glass half full rather than the glass half empty. Um, God wants us to stay positive. And that's why, you know, when we, when we, even when we look at the soul winning, right? Like God doesn't want to us to look at the map and see, oh, look at how many people didn't hear the gospel. He wants us to look at the map and see, look how many people did hear the gospel and look how many people have heard the gospel. Look how many people that we've gotten saved. Look how many people we've reached. That's the sort of mindset we ought to have uh, in this church. And it's the same with anything. You know, it's not about, how, oh, look how small we are. It's like, hey, look how many people we have. You know, I mean, we could be less than this, right? But, but we're not, praise the Lord. So um, not necessarily, you can't necessarily knock uh, a song based on the emotion that it gives. Uh, what, about, what about the depth of the lyrics? You know, a lot of criticism that comes on new songs will say, oh, you know, those lyrics are so shallow. But, you know, there are hymns where the lyrics are not that, not that deep. You know, I mean, what, what's an example? Like, uh, I'm trying to think of an example where it's just they're quite repetitive. Can you guys think of, like, God is so good? I know we sing that one, right? God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. I mean, is that a deep song? I mean, does that, does that mean it's wrong to sing just because the lyrics are not that deep? And, and how do you even judge depth of lyrics anyway? Isn't it subjective? Because somebody might hear God is so good and like, oh man, that's, that's so deep. He's so good and like, so good to me, not to anybody. Like, like it's, so it's a subjective measure, the deepness of lyrics. You know, does it nest, does de is deepness judged by the vocabulary? Do you know what I mean? Is, is it, the, is it the, the different types of words that you use that's what makes something more loose? Is it, is it the complexity of the topic that makes it deep? I mean, is, is it only songs that sing about you know, the Trinity and the complex topics that most people don't understand? Or can you have a song about a simple topic like love, but and yet be deep and speak to the heart and teach you something that is right? So I don't know if the depths of the lyrics is something that you can use to be critical of uh, a song. Um, another one is the beat or the genre. And, I, and I've linked these two together because really the genre of a song is really determined by the, the beat and the pattern of the tones, right? I mean, can, can you really say that a certain pattern of beats or a certain pattern of tones are inherently sinful? What, what makes them satanic? I don't know. I don't know if you could really um, take a strong stand on that um, when it comes to the beat or the genre. So I don't necessarily believe that you know for example blues is sinful or you know I guess the rock genre is sinful because I don't know what really makes it in and, in and of itself sinful um, I know why people believe it is wrong and sinful and I'm gonna get to that and and that might be something uh, that that is uh, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is that is a uh, legitimate um, so beat and genre, I don't think they are in and of themselves sinful. So I don't think that can be the way, reason why you critica, criti, criticize a song. And also it's a subjective measure. Do you know what I mean? Because who decides which one's satanic and who decides which one isn't? Um, another one is could be the writer. So who actually wrote the song? Who actually created the song? That could be a, a reason why you criticize it. But I don't even think this is really applied consistently anyway, because a lot of the old hymns that we sing are, sung, are, are, are written by Calvinists, are written by Anglicans, people that we would you know, believe teach false doctrine, teach a works-based salvation, but they've written some songs that are doctrinally correct. Um, and if you would apply it consistently, I mean, how could you judge a song, for example, Happy Birthday? 
or Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. I mean, who even wrote those? Let's say you found out that a Satanist wrote Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. I mean, would you sing ABC anymore? Because that's the same tune, right? Like A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Isn't that Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? Yeah. <laughs> so is it, is it, would it make it wrong then to teach our children the alphabet using the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star um, song if we found that out? I don't know whether it would make that song in and of itself satanic or sinful. But what I'm getting to is when we, when we think about why we would not want to sing certain songs or why would we, want, we would want to avoid certain songs, it's really the association, isn't it? Because if you found out that you know, Happy Birthday was created by some God-hating Satanist, that doesn't necessarily make the song wrong. But the question is, do we, do we, would I want to use that song with the common knowledge that it's associated with somebody that's a Satanist? And that's where I think it's a grey line, you know, because... Who do you want to associate with and who don't you want to associate with? I mean, we're given principles in the Bible where we don't want to associate with unbelievers and things like that, but how far are you going to draw that line? And that's why you know, people have different standards on, you know, this song may be associated with this. Will they use it or won't they use it? And generally we err on the side of caution. And this is why some people don't want to use the drum kit and the electrical guitar in their church, not because they are in and of themselves sinful, but because of the association with the worldly bands and the rock bands and things like that. They just don't want to look like that. Um, how far you want to draw that, I think it's up to a judgment of conscience and it's up to the judgment of whoever makes that decision in the church that decides to use that music. I just don't think you can consistently um, criticise them um, because of that. Because it is, again, I think a subjective measure when it comes to association. And that's why there's even dispute amongst churches like ours of who to fellowship with and who not to fellowship with. I mean, you've got to fellowship with a church that, you know, dresses more formally. You know, maybe there are churches that wouldn't want to associate with ours because we're a more casually dressed church. And there are things like that where, you know, you decide yourself what your standard is going to be and how far you're going to draw that. But my point is, it's a standard. It's not a, com it's not a commandment of God. It's something that is man-created in order to apply a principle that we have in the Bible. So the writer. But all to say this, so what ultimately, and you probably have sort of got this as I'm talking through these points, what ultimately makes a song wrong? Well, it's the words, isn't it? It's what it's teaching you. Because every song, like we were saying, every song creates an emotion but every song with lyrics, and most songs do have lyrics, has a message, has words to it that are teaching you something. And this is what I believe makes a song right or wrong, is what is the message that is being taught. And I do, I do believe there are songs that are neutral. I do believe there are songs that are just on generic topics that are not necessarily for or against God. Um, but that's how I believe we judge it. What does the song teach? What are the lyrics of the song? And what ultimately am I being taught and being influenced by the song, by the words that are being spoken by that song? Um, let's go to 1 Samuel 16, 23. Because we know music is a powerful tool, isn't it? I mean, music is a powerful tool to communicate words or communicate a message. And that's why often in the Bible we see you know, God's word put to song. We see the largest book in the Bible is the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is a song book, isn't it? Because song is used in order to communicate a message, in order to enforce a message, in order to teach truths. And this is why music is such a big part of church, because it's a way that we, like the Bible says, we fill ourselves with the Spirit. We remind ourselves of truths. We teach and admonish one another. I just want to show you here that the power of music that even in uh, uh, King Saul here, there's a verse here in 1 Samuel 16, uh, when, when God had actually put an evil spirit upon Saul. And verse 23 here in 1 Samuel says, And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So we see that music is a really powerful tool that even can affect you spiritually. So even though there, there are ways that people judge songs wrongly, you don't want to be naive about what music 
you listen to and what music you don't listen to because you need to know that the music that you listen to and the words that it has, it will affect you. It's not like you can just listen to it and it doesn't necessarily affect you. So I said throughout the Bible, you know, music is used to teach doctrine. We've got the book of Psalms, the largest book. And when we look at the Psalms, I mean, you read through the Psalms that were included in God's word. They are rich in stories. They're rich in truth. They're rich in doctrine. Um, you know, this is what God has used music in order to communicate. So don't be naive about the power of music. Right? Don't be naive about how music is used and how it's, how, how it's powerful because guess who wants to use it? Satan wants to use music you know, because Satan knows how powerful. So that's why Satan uses money as well. right? He uses riches to make people fall. He uses riches to get people in power and to corrupt people. Money in and of itself is not evil. We know that. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil, not money in and of itself. But music is the same thing. That's why music is inherently neutral. It's a tool that is powerful that can be used, but that means it can also be used by satanic forces um, that will want to use it to communicate a satanic or evil message. Um, let's look here in Ezekiel 28. You know, so with that in mind, you know, you really want to think about, you know, what sort of music are you listening to? You know, are you listening to music that's teaching you false things? You know, my brother once told me this story, you know, because he's a wedding photographer. And one time this couple used a song uh, to walk down the aisle and they really liked the tune, but they didn't realize that the lyrics were actually about breaking up, about like leaving each other. And my brother just thought that was so weird. Like, did they not think about the, the message that this song was communicating? I mean, they're ce celebrating a day where they're coming together and making an oath about each other. But see, they're not considering the message of the song. And this is what I want to bring to your attention this morning. When you listen to music, it's not about the beat of the music, the genre of the music, the instruments that are used, whether it's new or old. What you need to think about is what message is that song communicating? Because you might like the tune, right? You might think, hey, this is a boppy tune and this is something I grew up with. It's like your parents listen to the, goldie, oh, the, the, the golden oldies, right? And you're like, hey, these tunes are really cool. You know, like ABBA and Bee Gees and things like that. And, you know, even I think some of those, those, those tunes are pretty, pretty uh, cool to listen to. But then when you think about what they're actually singing about, you know, it's worldly. It's usually man glorifying. Sometimes it, you know, um, you know it, 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 it uh, is anti-God. So we need to think about what are, what's the sort of music that you're listening to and what is the sort of music that you're allowing your children to listen to? Because if you're listening to it, your children are listening to it too when you have it playing in the car, you have it playing at home. Don't be naive about it. In uh, Ezekiel uh, 28, 11, we see some insight into Satan. Um, I believe this is a prophecy about Satan. And we'll see here, even though it's a, it's a, it's a prophecy against the king of Tyrus, we see here that it is not just talking about a man, it is actually talking about a spiritual being here. And a lot of people believe this is talking about Satan. Ezekiel 28. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, thou say, Thus saith the Lord, the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So the first thing we see here about Satan is that he's very smart, isn't he? That's why he knows how to use the things that God has created against us, against the Lord and against the Lord's pur purposes, because he's, he's very intelligent. You know, don't think that Satan is just some idiot. He knows what's going on. He knows the word of God. He knows um, what makes men tick. And that's why he's so effective in what he does. Now seal us up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, isn't this interesting that, that Satan is very beautiful? So often, you know, we think about Satan, we think of this evil, ugly, demonic thing. But when you were actually, if you were to actually see Satan, the Bible describes him as beautiful. You know, that's one reason why he became so prideful. It's because he was beautiful. So often things that we see that are pleasant to the eyes, that are, are nice to look at, can be satanic. Because, um, you know, not only the Lord is be beauty, beautiful, but Satan is also beautiful too. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. So this is why, you know, we don't believe that this is just talking about a man because now it's saying, hey, you were back in the garden of Eden. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, and the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, 
the emerald and the carbuncle and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets. Oh, look at this. The, this is what I wanted to point out. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So this is interesting that Satan himself is a musical creature, isn't he? So not only did God create music for us to praise him and for us to enjoy, but Satan is also a musical creature. So he knows how to use music to influence people. Um, it's interesting here as well. It says, thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but you know, Satan, Satan is not an eternal being. Like a lot of people think of Satan as like the anti-God. He's, he, you know, you have God that's eternal. He's like the white, you know, white God. And then you have Satan who's like the black God. He, he's the eternal God of darkness. He rules in hell and God rules in heaven. No, that's not the case. God rules in heaven and he rules in hell because he's the ruler of all. Uh, and in fact, Satan was created. He was a created being. He's an angel that had a point in time but he's also finite. So Satan is not everywhere at once. You can't say, oh, Satan made me do this. Satan is here. Satan. Satan is in one place at one time. He can't be influencing everyone at every one time. I mean, his influence with his message and uh, that sort of influence can infect a lot of people, but his location is only at one place in one time. Uh, and he's finite. He was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast... Uh, upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. So we see here that Satan has not yet been cast down to hell. He's still, like in Job, going in and out through the earth, and he still is able to go to heaven. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. So this is another thing. Like, God created Satan perfect. You know, he created a perfect angel just like he created men, but angels have free will. He used his free will to sin against God. And, you know, it's interesting. I always wonder what it means when it says, you know, he, he was the cherub that covereth. You know, like, you know, what does that mean? And the thought that I have is, you know, when the Bible talks in 1 Corinthians about the hair being a, a covering for, for the lady and it being a glory to her, it's sort of like what you see when you look at a lady. Um, I wonder if that was the purpose of Satan, why he was created beautiful, why he was created as a musical being, because maybe he was created to, to be sort of something that you, when you looked at the glory of God, that he was like one of those jewels that made the glory of God beautiful. But it was his beauty and wisdom and his, his, uh, his, his, his appearance that made him prideful to want to actually be what he was meant to glorify. Um, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. And then it goes on uh, to say in verse 17, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Verse 18, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries. So we see here that Satan is also a religious creature. See, he has sanctuaries, doesn't he? So you don't just think, oh, just because this person is religious or this organization is religious doesn't necessarily mean it's not satanic because Satan has created religions. He's created organizations to get people away from the truth. And that's why we believe religions like Catholicism, religions like Mormonism, religions like the Jehovah's Witnesses, and uh, they have their sanctuaries. And it's not, you know, they pretend to be Christian. But then they have doctrines of devils. They have satanic doctrines just because they look beautiful. Just because they have sanctuaries doesn't mean it's of God because Satan also um, does the same things. Uh, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And I believe that's prophesying about the destruction of Satan as we read in Revelation where he's bound and cast into the lake of fire. So don't be, what's our point here? Don't be naive. Don't be naive about music. Music is powerful. Satan can use music. So what are you filling your heart with? Look at what it says here in Luke 6.45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For the, of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. 
So what are you filling your heart with? You know, if you're filling your heart with evil treasure, when you speak, that evil treasure is going to come out. So fill your heart with good treasure. Um, that ought to be what you listen to. So, you know, so people, you know, if you're listening to songs all day, you know, about, you know, I remember when I used to be in high school and in university, you know, the hip hop scene is like really popular. You know, you go to the clubs and you think, you know, the beat, you know, this is what people dance to, right? And in the clubs and they got their beer and they're dancing. But, what, but if you think about it, I'm not saying that those songs are wrong because of the beat. The reason why those songs are wrong is because of the message that it's singing to you. And if you think about these hip-hop songs that are song, sung by the Hollywood stars these days, what is it about? It's about fornication. It's about uncleanness. It's about ungodliness. It's about you know, not wanting anything to do with God. And, and you, you think, you know, why is it so hard to get rid of your old lifestyle, to get rid of your old friends and old ways of living? I mean, maybe if you're listening to this thing day in and day out, you're listening to about being some pimp in the club with your prostitutes, you know, maybe you'll start to desire that because you're listening to it day in and day out. So, you know, don't be shocked if you're listening to these sorts of music, you're listening you know, to songs about, you know, how, how love should be and, you know, this Hollywood style of love. And then you start to, you know, uh, have wrong ideas about love. You know, you read about, you know, leaving your wife and, and chasing this dream about with this girl, and then you start wanting to do that because what you listen to, what you listen to, is going to affect how you behave. It's going to affect your spirit, and if you keep doing that, don't be surprised if you start having those desires because that's what you're filling your heart with. Um, and this is what I believe, you know, Second Corinthians is talking about. You know, we go to 2 Corinthians. I just want to show you here and just give you some context. You know, this is, these are some really um, familiar verses where it talks about not being unequally yoked. Um, verse 14, be, not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So that's the very familiar passage. But I wanted to show you this verse in verse 7, because it follows on from that idea. It says, having therefore these promises so the promises it's talking about is before where you know we'll be a son and a daughter of god and we'll dwell with him forever it's saying because of that having therefore these promises dearly beloved let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of god now michael asked me this question one day i was thinking you know what is we, we know what the filthiness of the flesh is you know like fornication and things like that you know dr maybe drugs and just you know destroying your body but what is the filthiness of the spirit you know because i thought we ha we have a we have a new spirit when we're born again right we have a perfect spirit well, what i think this filthiness is talking about like we're talking about the message you know remember when jesus said in john 6 the words that i speak unto you they are spirit and they are life so is, there is a pure type of spirit, which is the Word of God. So when we listen to the Word of God, we sing about the truths of God. That is the righteous uh, spiritual uh, influence on our life. But when we listen to the songs of the world, we, sing, we listen to songs about sin and about fornication and about you know, uncleanness, that I believe is what this verse is talking about when it talks about the filthiness of the spirit. And this is how Satan can influence us, right? Because he can create songs. He can create preachers. He can create religions that are teaching a false doctrine and teaching filthiness of the spirit. And that's why false doctrine and false prophets are often associated with uncleanness and fornication and sexual immorality. So what are some places to be aware of? You know, music filling your heart. I just want to point out a few. Um, that I think, you know, we need to be aware of where we don't just lackadaisically let all this music and all this song enter our heart. You know, one is with YouTube videos, right? Videos on Facebook and videos on YouTube. You know, often we'll watch an interesting video and it might be like, you know, highlights, right? UFC highlights, soccer highlights, where people, you know, they want to find out what happened with that game. That's not necessarily wrong to do, but you want to watch something, right? But what, what, what is the music that it's often put to? 
often put, you know, people often make these highlight reels and put it to hip hop music and put it to that. So, you know, my recommendation is if you're going to listen to, watch those videos, at least turn the music off. You know, you don't, want, you don't want your house filled with that sort of music and just let it, you know, sink into your ears um, if you're just going to be watching something about a sport or something like that. So just be aware of YouTube mu music um, and videos. Uh, I generally just have the sound off if I'm watching things like that. Um, but even advertising jingles. You know, sometimes advertisements will use not good music. So this is why I don't think it's necessarily good, you know, when you get into the car just to turn on the radio and just have it playing. You know, get it, you get home, you just turn on the TV and just leave it playing. Because you're not being discerning about what is going to enter your heart and what isn't. And that's the problem. That's the difference between the internet and with, and with a TV in your house. You know, that's why I don't have a TV in my house, but I'm not going to get all holier than now and say, oh, look at me, I don't have a TV in my house. Because nowadays, you can get everything you want on TV on a computer, right? And most people that have a TV in their house have multiple computers in their house. So I think it's a bit, bit pharisaical to say, don't necessarily have a TV in your house. But the problem with the TV is not the TV in and of itself. You know, it's what you're watching on that TV. And if you just turn it on and just play it in the background and it's just filling your mind with all the junk, yeah, there are some good things on TV, but there's a lot of bad things on TV too. And that's why even on the internet, you don't just turn the internet on and just play some channel and just leave it playing the whole time. I mean, generally when you watch YouTube or something, right, you're selecting what videos you want to watch. There's a bit of proactive discernment there. But when you turn on a TV, you get in your car, you turn on the radio, there's no discernment. And that's the problem with those things is because you're just saying, hey, I'm going to turn on this channel and just serve me up what you've got. You don't, you don't, you don't even care what is coming from that channel. And that's the problem with um, things like that. You know, some other things you just want to be aware of. You know, sometimes we can't always avoid these things. I'm not just saying totally avoid them. I'm just saying you need to be aware of it so that at least you limit the amount of intake you get. You know, when you go to shopping centers and grocery stores, you know, they're playing the radio music. That's also filling your heart. Um, you know, you hang out places. You know, a lot of young people, they like to go to cafes, right? Uh, we're like, uh, they say that our generation is the latte generation, where people just want to go to cafes and hang out and sip some latte, right? Um, you know, that, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but choose the places you want to hang out with. Uh, choose the places you want to hang out. You know, don't go to a cafe that's just blasting worldly music and things like that. And you can't always avoid it. It's not necessarily wrong to go there once or twice, but if that's like your regular hangout spot, you need to be aware of what's being pumped into your heart. Um, so think about things like that. Hangout places like cafes that play radio, the world's songs. You know, parties and work functions. You know, sometimes you need to go to a birthday party. Sometimes you need to go to a work function. But, you know, did you need to go to the work function every Friday? Every Saturday night with your colleagues at the, at the pub or the club? You know, not necessarily, right? So just think about these things. Um, I want to show you this verse in John 17, verse 14. Because I think of music, you know, the spiritual filth. It's a bit, it works a bit like physical filth, doesn't it? You know, you, you can't totally eliminate all the toxins out of your life. You know, I mean, we live in a toxic world, right? With the fluoride in our water, um, you know, with all the pesticides they spray on our food, with all the chemtrails they're spraying in the air. I mean, Desiree was telling me that on Thursday it was particularly bad. I remember driving to work and looking up, there's all these lines going across the air and just thinking like, what the, what the hell are they spraying up there? Um, you know, it's interesting that uh, even Desiree was telling me about her husband, like he worked at Bankstown Airport and the security at Bankstown Airport, which... You know, I mean, who even flies in and out of Bankstown Airport? When's the last time you saw a plane go in and out of Bankstown Airport? And she's sort of suspecting, is, is that where they're keeping all the chemicals for the chemtrail? Because that's where all the planes, you know, fly out from when they go and spray all that stuff. And it's such high security. They don't let, like, Iranians and, like, Middle Eastern people work there. You have to be, like, white Australian to work there. So um, who knows, right? You know, just around the corner, maybe that's where the hub is, where they import all their drugs and everything like that. But... What I, well, my point is, right, is, you know, you can't sometimes escape all the toxins in this world. And it's, it's like that in the spiritual world, right? You can't necessarily eliminate all the toxic spiritual things from your world. But if you don't discern what you allow into your spiritual body, just like you don't discern what you allow in your physical body, eventually you're going to get a disease, right? People that don't care about what they eat, people that don't care about what they put in their body, they just trust blindly the scientists and say, oh, this is good for me, so I'm going to do it, without thinking about, hey, what's actually, you know, like vaccines. 
you know, you can be for or against vaccines, but at least know what's in the vaccine. Don't just believe somebody blindly and just inject something into your body and not even know what's in the vaccine. But, you know, people, you know, they're not discerning about what they eat. You know, eventually you're going to get cancer. Eventually you're going to get diabetes, right? So it's the same in the spiritual world. It's, it, it's similar. Where you say, hey, if you're not discerning about the spiritual filthiness that you allow in your body, hey, maybe one day you'll get some spiritual cancer and you'll, just, you'll get out of church, right? You'll have some spiritual cancer where you're just so depressed or you're just so out of it that you'll fall away from the faith and you won't come back. Just like physically, you'll just get so unhealthy that now you can no longer get to a position of health. So take care of your physical health, you know, but also take care of your spiritual health. You can't necessarily eliminate it, but what it's about, it's about limiting how much of the toxin uh, you take in. Look at what it says here in John 17. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So Jesus is even saying here, like, I don't want my disciples to be totally cut off from all sin because they're going to be in the world. But he's praying that, he, that we would be kept from the evil. So we want to limit the amount of evil that comes to us. Look at verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for, for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So when I think about the truth sanctifying us and, and Jesus is saying, I sanctify myself, I want others to be sanctified, I think about it like a spiritual detox, isn't it? Like, like nowadays, you know, detox is like the buzzword, right? Everything's about detox, detoxing this, detoxing that. Well, what we need is a spiritual detox, right? You need to get the spiritual filth out of your life. And how do you spiritually detox? Well, you need to take something to detox, right? Well, you need to take the word of truth. The word of God is what is going to detox you from spiritual filthiness and this is why you need to get in your bible you need to you need to discuss the bible you need to meditate on the bible you need to memorize the bible and this is one of the reason why uh, you know i want to do these cartoons for the kids because I, I, i'm trying to figure out ways i'm using these tools to try and get the word of god into our children just an easier way to help parents teach children the word of god because we want to detox these um, spiritual filth out of our body all right, the last thing I just want to cover is the purpose of music in church. Let's go to Ephesians 5. I hope it's been interesting so far. Um, so again, we'll just read the commandments in the New Testament um, for, the, for the church to sing. It says here in Ephesians 5, Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see the parallel passage in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we talked about two weeks, two weeks ago why we don't have musical instruments. Go back and listen to that sermon if you want to. So that you're, because you probably come here to church and you're wondering, like, why doesn't this church use musical instruments? And I sort of talked about it last time. I'll just say it again for the new guys that are here. But you know, a lot of people will say, well, why don't, why don't these people use new, use instruments? And they'll come here because it's weird, and they say like, oh, we're not used to musical instruments. But it's not because we just don't have the talent. You know, like we don't have the talent right now, but it doesn't matter. We, well, there's a reason why we don't use musical instruments. But go back and listen to that sermon two weeks ago where I go into that topic in depth. What I want to talk about now is the purpose that God has for music in the New Testament church. And really, there's these two verses that really um, go into depth on what music is meant to accomplish. But number one is, let's go to Hebrews 13.5. We see here in verse 16, it says, Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So one of the things, one of the purposes of music in church is to praise the Lord, right? To sing to God. Um, if, if music in a church just becomes about singing to one another, then that's wrong. You know, yes, we are meant to sing to one another. That is one of the purposes, but that is not the only purpose. If that becomes the only purpose, then it's wrong because one of the main purposes is to sing to the Lord. Um, and why do we want to sing to the Lord? And I believe it's just because God likes it. 
God's pleased with it. God created you with a voice and he wants you to use that voice to praise him. Look at what it says here in um, uh, is it Hebrews, I have the right passage here, Hebrews, oh, Hebrews 13, 15, sorry, not Hebrews 13, 5. Look at what it says here in Hebrews 13, 5. It says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So we see here that the praise given to God is likened to the sacrifices in the Old Testament. The sacrifices in the Old Testament, which would be a burnt sacrifice. It would be a sweet savor unto the Lord. The smoke symbolizing the, the, you know, that, 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 uh, that sacrifice ascending up to God. Well, in the same way, when we praise God with our mouth, when we sing to the Lord, that goes up to God. It's a sweet smell to him. It's a sacrifice that is pleasing to him. He likes it. And that's why we want to do it, because we, we want to please the Lord. And it says here, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So we ought not to only be praising God and singing to the Lord only in church, but in our personal lives as well, daily as we praise God in our lives, not just when we gather as a church. Uh, what's another reason? Let's just go back to Colossians 3.16. The Bible says here, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So another purpose of the music in church is to teach and admonish. And I sort of talked about this at the beginning when we talked about how music is used. It's used in order to communicate a message and to help people to, uh, uh, to reflect and, and meditate on things. That is how God wants us to use music. He wants us to use music in order to teach and admonish one another. What does that mean? It means both what is right and also exhort you to do right. So we don't just sing songs. You know how there are songs about the truths, right? There are songs like the old rugged cross where we talk about, you know, we reflect on what Jesus Christ did for us. We have songs like uh, redeemed, you know, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. We're talking about a truth about how we were redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But the Bible says that we ought to teach and admonish one another. So it's not only teaching. Songs ought not to just teach you what is right, but also admonish you to do what is right. And that's why we sing songs like, you know, bring them in. You know, we'll work till Jesus comes because these songs are, ought, ought to encourage and exhort you unto love and good works. Uh, songs about going soul winning. You know, bring them in. Who is on the Lord's side? So this is what songs ought to do. And, you know, when we talk about teaching and admonishing one another, it's both yourself and others. So songs ought to teach yourself truths, but it also ought to teach others one another truths. That's why in church you need to sing up, you need to sing loud because you want other people to hear you. You know, because we need to speak to one another. If you're just singing to the Lord in your head, you're not speaking to one another. That's why you have to sing out loud and sing to one another so that you can teach and admonish your brother and sister in Christ that's sitting next to you that may not know the song. So you should sing to be heard by others. Um, and it's to edify, it's not to glorify self. And, you know, people say, well, I don't want to sing loud because I'm not trying to bring attention to myself, you know, like the other people that can sing well, right? They're just, they're just trying to show people how good their voice is. No, no, no. Um, we sing loud. It, it, it's about the intention, why you want to sing loud, right? Because just because somebody's singing loud, that doesn't necessarily mean that their intention is to glorify themselves. See, when I sing loud, it's not to bring attention to myself. I'm trying to drill some doctrine into you guys. You know, I'm singing loud because I want you guys to hear the words. And I want to also help you guys learn the song and things like that. So you should, be sing, you should sing to be heard by others to edify, not to glorify yourself. And, you know, it's not necessarily for entertainment. You know, the purpose is to teach and admonish one another, not to entertain one another. And this is why we don't, that's, this is the reason why I don't think musical instruments are necessary because the only thing that musical instruments add to church singing is the entertainment value, right? Or unless it's aiding the singing. But if you have enough strong singers, all a musical instrument does is make it harder to hear the voices of your brothers and sisters in Christ. So how are your brothers and sisters in Christ teaching and admonishing you with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs when you can't even hear them? You know, because in some churches the music is so loud you, know, you can't even hear yourself, let alone other people. So how is that music teaching and admonishing uh, one another? Um, you know, you need to be understood. 
right? You've got to teach and admonish somebody else in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That means people have to sing in a way that you can even understand what they're singing. So this is why, I, you know, I don't like it when people get up, you know, in specials and things like that, and they sing in like an opera voice, or they sing in a way, uh, you know, like, like the way pop singers sing these days, where you don't even know what they're saying. Then what's the point of a song where you don't even know the words that they're saying? How is that meant to teach and admonish you when you don't even understand the words? And it was funny, like in my old church, I used to say, hey, when there's a special, can we like put the lyrics up on the board? Because sometimes I don't even know what the words of the song are because I don't, I don't, the way that they're singing it, they, they meld the words together. You can't even hear the different words. Um, so that's another thing, you know, you need to be understood if you want to teach and admonish. Uh, and one thing I want to encourage you guys to do as well is, is learn the songs. You know, learn the songs if you don't know them. You know, don't come week after week after week and then just say, I don't know this song, and then just sit there silent. You know, take some time to learn them. You know, try and sing them. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to sing them. Try and sing along so that you'll learn the songs. If you don't know them, hey, go look them up. You know, some of the songs are on the Google Drive. You can download them and listen to them. You know, I apologize that it's mainly my voice. But, you know, you can listen to it and you can learn the songs. You know, maybe just get a version on YouTube that sounds a bit better. Learn the songs so that you can sing them along with us. Hey, sing them to your children. Sing them with your children so that they learn the songs because you want to, I think, create a behavior and a habit where they like this type of music um, so that they'll grow up liking it um, so that they'll enjoy singing it. Now, because songs ought to teach and admonish us, that means songs with wrong doctrine should be changed uh, or not sung. Um, so even in a church, you know, just because you have a hymn book doesn't necessarily mean every hymn in that book is good to sing. So uh, we ought to be discerning about what songs we ought to sing and what songs we shouldn't. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of songs that I believe have false doctrine. And the first one I want to show you here is Victory in Jesus. This is a song that is uh, sung in a lot of churches. You know, I, uh, I'll just let it load. And you're thinking, what's wrong with this song? Well, let me show you the lyrics and then we'll see. It says, I heard an old, old story, how a Saviour came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Now, is that how we're saved? Are we saved by repenting of our sins? No. So why would I want to sing a song saying this is how to get saved? We don't get saved by repenting of our sins. I don't care how you swing it. I mean, repenting of your sins is works. You know, if you have to turn from a sin in order to be saved, then that works. That's works. And you know, some people will say, well, unbelief is a sin. I've heard people say this. Unbelief is a sin. Therefore, you need to repent of unbelief. So it's right to say I repent of my sins in order to be saved. Well, that, that's silly, because then you could say, well, you have to obey God to be saved, because God is commanding you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a commandment. So if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, do you now have to keep the... Is it right for me to say, obey the commandments to be saved? You know, we want, to be we want some clarity in how we uh, communicate a message. So, yeah, if you, if you change, you know, what that means, and you just, just so you can use the phrase, I don't know whether that's really beneficial to the listener. But... You know, some people, they'll say that repenting of your sins is just acknowledging that you're a sinner. But that doesn't even make sense because acknowledging you're a sinner doesn't save you either. I mean, if, you, if somebody just acknowledged their sin, are they saved yet? No, right? So if repentance is just the acknowledgement of your sin, then repentance of your sin is not going to save you. You know, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, this is wrong. You know, this is why, you know, we don't sing this. Well, I mean, I don't have these lyrics, to be honest, because I think it's a copyrighted song. But, you know, this is why we will never sing this verse in this church like this. You know, maybe we ought to change it, right? And this is why some people have changed it. Um, maybe we ought to change it to something like this. You know, I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, and then I trusted only him and won the victory. And uh, people have different ones. They'll say, you know, and then I believed on Jesus Christ and won the victory. So we don't necessarily have to throw out the whole song. You know, just change it to where the doctrine is wrong. You know, let's use the catch. I like the tune of victory in Jesus. But if we're going to sing it, let's sing it with the right doctrine. Yeah, let's, look about, look at, let's look at a couple of others. Now, this is one of my favorite songs, right? This is one of my favorite songs 
my Saviour's love. And you're probably thinking, what's wrong with this song? Well, let me show you what I think is wrong with this song. Most of it is pretty, pretty good. This is verse 2. It says, For me it was in the garden. He prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. Oh, that sounds really good, doesn't it? Like Jesus Christ, he sweat so hard that he sweat drops of blood. But do you know that that's not even true? I'll show you in Luke, uh, in the passage in Luke. Luke 22. Because pe a, a lot of people believe that Jesus sweat so much that he actually sweat blood. But if you've read the Bible in Luke 22, that's not actually what it says. It says here, And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. So was he actually sweating drops of blood? Or was he just sweating and the Bible was just saying the sweat drops were like drops of blood? Do you see what I mean? So when we sing a song over and over again, this song may be the reason why you think Jesus Christ sweat blood, right? Because we sing all these songs saying, oh, he sweat blood in the, in, the garden of, in the garden of Gethsemane. He sweat drops of blood for my... But did he? He didn't. You know, and this is obviously a more minor doctrinal issue but my point is still there that if we sing songs we don't discern is what that song is teaching us right or wrong we're going to get a wrong idea and it's not actually biblical do you see so you know maybe we want to change this to something like this which is what if you notice if we've sung this in church i have changed it to this it says for me it was in the garden he prayed not my will but thine he had no tears for his own griefs but went to the cross for mine tell me like and here's another one, last example. Here's the lily of the valley. So this song goes like this. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. Hallelujah, he's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. So it's a great tune, isn't it? It makes you sort of want to dance along to it. But is it true? There's a couple of things I've underlined here. First one I want to address is the fairest of 10,000. Now at first I thought this was wrong, but it's not actually wrong. But I just underlined it because I just wanted to show you a couple of verses to do with this. Fairest of 10,000. Where, where do they actually, like a lot of these passages from that song come from the Song of Solomon. But I want to show you in Song 5.10. The Bible says here, this is, I think this is the only passage, I don't think there's another passage, where they get this fairest among 10,000. It says, but my beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. So my first thought when I heard fairest of 10,000, isn't fair like used to describe a woman? Like why would I want to call the Lord fair? Um, and isn't it, doesn't it say the chiefest among 10,000? It doesn't say he's the fairest among 10,000. So should we change that to he's the chiefest of 10,000 to my soul? But, you know, with further study, I don't actually think it's wrong. Because let me show you a couple of other verses. Psalm um, 45. Two. This is, God, this is um, David talking about God. He says, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. So I do believe God doesn't mind, you know, being called fair, being called beautiful, you know, because he is beautiful. Um, and even here, David is describing God as fairer than the children of men. And I'll show you another passage as well in Daniel where men are described as being fair. Look at here. This is Daniel, if you remember, that they, did, they purposed in their heart not to defile themselves with the king's meat. They said, hey, we're going to eat pulse and then see how we fare. Um, and in verse 15, it says here, and at the end of 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. So, I don't think, so you know, the, the word of God actually corrected me there because I'm saying, hey, it's the cheapest of 10,000. But, you know, God can rightly be described as the fairest of 10,000 because it's not wrong to describe God using the adjective fair. Now, the lily of the valley, let's just go to that because in Song uh, chapter 2, the reason why I don't think it's right to praise God by calling him the lily of the valley because where we get the lily of the valley from, from is in Songs chapter 2. And if we read these chapters here, 
I don't believe it's actually describing God. It's actually describing a, a lady uh, and in the relationship of a man and a woman, a man and his wife, the church is represented, uh, the, the wife is represented, the church is represented by the wife and the husband is represented by God. So it says here in Songs 2, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. So you think, well, you know, is that God talking about himself? I don't think so, because it says in verse 2, As the lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. So this is a lady speaking here, saying, My love among the daughters is like the lily among thorns, because she is the rose of Sharon. She's that flower. She's the lily of the valley. Now look at verse 3. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. So how is the man described in this relationship? He's described as an apple tree. A, you know, an apple tree, like a strong, big tree that's fruitful, right? That has the seed, I guess you could say. Um, but the rose, the beautiful, uh, delicate flower is the lady in the relationship. And I believe it symbolizes the church. So if God is using the lily of the valley to describe the lady in the relationship and the apple, of the, you know, the, the apple tree among the trees of the wood as the man of the relationship, should we be praising God as a flower, as the lady, when that's not how he describes himself? I don't believe so. I don't think we should um, make God the feminine side of the relationship when he's the ma masculine side of the relationship. And this is why I think this song, The Lily of the Valley, um, is not a good song to sing in that way because it's drumming into us that God is the lily of the valley when he's not. I believe the church, is, when it's sanctified by God, is that beautiful flower, right? It's sanctified and cleansed by the washing of water by the word. It is represented by the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. So what can we change it to? Anyone got any ideas? I'll show you what my idea is, but then... What do you guys think? Anyone want to throw out? The apple, the tree, the tree, apple tree. He's the apple. He's the apple tree of the trees. Yeah, he's the apple tree of the trees. The bright and morning star. Yeah, you can sing it that way. Here's my, here's my suggestion. I've got the everlasting father. That sort of fits. The everlasting father, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. And maybe change that to chiefest of 10,000. But fairest of 10,000 maybe just sounds better because I'm used to that. He's the chiefest, he's the chiefest of 10,000 to my soul. Anyways, there's a couple of examples. But just to bring to your attention that not every hymn is good to sing because not every hymn has correct doctrine in it. Now the last thing, I want to show you Ephesians. Go back to Ephesians 5. Now remember it said here in Ephesians 5, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now the Bible says speaking to yourselves. Now this is the reason why we sing congregationally, right? That's one of the reasons why, because it's saying we're speaking to ourselves. I don't think it's necessarily limited to congregational singing, but you might ask the question, why do we sing the songs that we do in church? Why do the songs that we sing in church have a certain style? Well, the reason why they have a certain style is it's to allow congregational singing. Because if you think about it, right, like if, if I got up, up here and said, okay, let's sing a song together, and then we sang a rap song. I mean, how are we, we going to even sing that together where the beat is all off and, you know, how do you even know when to sing each word to sing together? So that's the reason why we don't sing like rap songs and we don't sing songs like with a hip hop type of style because we're trying to sing songs together that have a simpler rhythm to aid congregational singing so that we can sing songs together. So, you know, that's why, you know, I'd encourage you guys to be here early so that you're here for the singing, right? Because you need to be here in order to sing with us to, to speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Um, Somebody might ask the question, but why, Victor, do you only sing old songs? You know, you're saying new songs aren't bad. Why do you only sing old songs? Well, you know, to be honest, the only reason why we sing old songs in this church is because of copyright issues. Because if you want to sing the new songs and you want to publicly sing those songs, I don't know all the laws, but I know you have to like pay a licensing fee and then you have to like report on which songs you sung so that they know how to divide your licensing fee up to pay all the different royalties. And so you, this, these are the things you don't know about churches that, you know, that's what they have to do in order to sing the new Hillsong songs and to new, sing all the new songs. They have to pay all these royalties. They have to pay a license to sing those songs. 
And you know, I'm not against that. You know, there's not, I'm not saying that all those songs are wrong. I don't do it because I'm against them. I just do it because I'm trying to simplify things and I don't have the time to, to do all that stuff. If somebody wanted to do that and they wanted to take ownership of that and, and organize the licensing fee and do all the reporting and you know, make sure we're, we're following all those laws, then yeah, we'll sing those songs. But the reason why I sing all these old songs is because all these old songs are in the public domain. You know, they're non-copyright, so I don't get into any trouble. Uh, there's no risk of any trouble uh, singing those songs in, in a public uh, sphere. So that's why we sing the old songs, is because they're easy to sing congregationally and they don't have any copyright issues. Now, the last thing I want to say about congregational singing, because the question came up, is what about special items? You know, a lot of churches have people get up and sing a special item where it's a solo or it'd be a group of people singing to the church. Am I against that? Personally, I'm not against that. I don't think it's wrong for people to sing specials. You might ask, well, why don't we have any specials in this church? Well, who wants to sing a special? <laughs> Nobody? Well, that's why we don't have them. Because <laughs> if you, if, hey, if you want to get up and sing a song, sing a special uh, to the people, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily against that. I do have some rules. I just think you know, most people in our church don't want to. Uh, I personally as well don't see the purpose of a special if it can be sung congregationally. If it's a so song that we can all sing together, what's the point of one person only singing it? But you know, there may be a point because there are some songs that are not conducive for congregational singing, but do have a great truth in it that can be a blessing to the hearers that we might want to share with people. You know, my old church, I did sing specials because I think, hey, it's great. If there's a song that we don't normally sing, I think it was a great song that touched my heart. Hey, I wanted to share that with everybody else and sing that song. So I did sing specials at my old church. I'm not necessarily against specials. Um, I don't know if they are necessary, if we can sing them all together. You know, you might want to sing a special to teach a song, right? Because I mean, if, you know, did I just sing some special singing you those songs? You know, you know what's the special, what's not a special? Um, so you might want to sing something as a solo to teach people a new song, maybe be a blessing to the hearers. hearers. But I will say this though, um, you know, I personally do believe that only men should sing specials. I don't think women should sing specials. I think when it comes to the teaching ministry of the church, this is why we even read this morning in 1 Timothy that the women should learn in silence. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, I don't know all the reasons why God has it that way, but God has commanded very clearly in the Bible that when the teaching is going on in the church, that's why at this time that women ought to be silent. They ought to learn in silence and they can ask questions afterwards. Um, that's why women should not say amen if they agree with something because they ought to learn in silence like the Bible says. And this is another reason why I don't think women should get up and sing specials because specials is part of the teaching ministry. You're getting up and you're teaching the congregation something. So I believe it is something that is reserved for the men of the church. And I just wanted to show you here a couple of verses before we close. We already know that songs teach, that we uh, t speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But if somebody's going to get up and do a solo or a special, that it should be a man because it's teaching the congregation something. Um, look at what it says here in 1 Chronicles 25. Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service of the sons of Asaph and of Heman and of Jeduthun, who should prophesy with harps. So you see here that it's teaching the congregation, prophesy with hearts, with psalteries, and with symbols, and the number of the workmen according to their service was. Of the sons of Asaph, Zachar and Joseph and Nathaniah, Asarelah, the sons of Asaph, under the hands of Asaph, which prophesied according to the order of the king. So you see how these guys were the singers in the Old Testament uh, temple, and they were prophesying with song. They weren't just singing with song. It makes it a point to say here, they taught and prophesied with song. Of Juduthan, the sons of Juduthan, Gedaliah and Zeri and Jeshiah and Hashabiah uh, and Mattathiah, six under the hands of their father, Juduthan, who prophesied with a harp to give thanks and to praise the Lord. Let me show you this verse as well in 1 Corinthians 14. I don't know if you've ever noticed this in 1 Corinthians 14 when it talks about how a church ought to be run in decency and in order. But this is interesting. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 26. He says here, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm? 
right, which is a song, right? So he's saying here, you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak, two or three, and let the other judge. And if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace, that ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So we get an idea here of how the church ought to be run. Like if people are going to speak, they're going to speak one or two or three and that by course. You know, some people say, well, why do we only have one speaker in the morning? Well, generally it's just because it's probably a bit too heavy for you guys, right? If we have two people preaching in the morning. But I wouldn't be against that, right? If some churches have multiple people bring a message in the morning, but they ought not to be doing it all at once, right? It's ought to be one after another and that by course. And you don't do it in an unknown language. You do it in a language that people can understand because you're doing it for the purpose of edifying. But the point I'm trying to bring out here is part of that was a song, you know, because he's saying here, everyone hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. And he's saying here, you do that all by one, one by one. And then look what it says. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, for they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now what is this speaking talking about? It's not just talking about conversing with other people. The context here is the teaching. Right? Men are getting up, they are teaching, they are singing to one another, not the congregational singing, because we have in Ephesians and the Colossians speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So I believe that is something that is reserved for the men of the church if men want to get up and teach with song uh, or with preaching. All right, so I hope that was interesting for you. A couple of things to think about there uh, in regards to music. Um, so I hope you learned something this morning. All right, let's pray. All right, Lord, thank you for your word and thank you, Lord, for uh, the gift of music that you've given to mankind. I pray, Lord, that we would use it to praise and glorify you. Lord, that we would use it to teach one another, that we would use it to teach our children. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you uh, help us to be weary of the, the dangers of music, that it can be used by uh, Satan and his forces to influence us negatively. Help us to cleanse our spirit of filthiness and uh, Lord just keep us from the evil of this world help us Lord to be a good influence on the world and uh, we thank you Lord for your word how it can spiritually detoxify our spirit and um, thank you Lord for our church and, and pray Lord that you'll continue to use it and continue to use um, the soul winning as well keep us cool out there today and we love you Lord we praise you in Jesus name Amen <laughs>